I was 27 at the time, uh, just parked outside my house, very careless. I was very careless. I never locked my car doors. And uh, suddenly a guy just appeared there. He, opened, he was looking for someone. Put a knife to my throat and just said to me, move over or so I'll kill you. It's a miracle that I survived it physically. And I think that's why my story became known in South Africa at the time. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. This case was suggested to me and thank you very much for your suggestion. And actually, funny enough, I've never heard of this case before. This case happened the same year I was born, so quite a while back. And this case was very violent and just one of those cases that were wrong place, wrong time. But I just want to say thank you again for your suggestions and keep them coming. So before we start, I do just want to give a heads up that there are some graphic details in this case. So please just do watch this case with caution. But with that being said, let's get into it. Intended for mature audiences only. Alison Jane Collier, or now known as Alison Boerter, was born in Port Elizabeth, South Africa in the 1960s. Alison was a very fun, loving kid who loved to play, who loved to explore. But as she started to grow up, she kind of didn't really have a set idea of what she wanted to be as an adult. You know, like when you're in high school, you have this, oh, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a vet or whatever it is. But she didn't really have any kind of goals like that at all in high school. But once high school ended, she kind of figured that she had to get something under her belt. So she did a year course in secretarial work. And then once Alison was done with this course, she then decided, actually, I have something under my belt and now I'm going to travel. So she then spent the next four years traveling around the world. Eventually, Alison did come back to South Africa and she decided now that she wanted to kind of settle down a little bit. And then Alison got a job and worked as an insurance broker here in South Africa. So one night, Alison and her friends decided that they were going to get together and they were just going to have some good old fun and just drink, eat and play some games. Alison was with her friend Kim at the time. So Kim and Alison went to another friend's house and they continued to eat and drink for the night. So at night they decided to drink, but during the day, this group of friends were at the beach. They were playing volleyball. They were also drinking on the beach. So it was an entire day of just having absolute ball with the friends. And by the way, for some context, this was on the 18th of December, 1994, and Alison was 27 years old at the time. So Alison and Kim are now done partying and done socializing, and they decide to head home early the next morning, by the way. Alison and Kim hop into Alison's car and they start driving home. Alison drops Kim off at home and then she runs some errands. She gets some food and she picks up her laundry. And because Alison got home really early the next morning, Generally, people are sleeping by this time. So the parking lot that she had always kind of outside her house was taken by somebody else. So she had to park a bit further down than she usually would. Alison said herself that she was not incredibly safety conscious. She wouldn't look around her very often. She would kind of leave her handbag on the side of the chair in the car and she would never lock the doors of her car. It was just something that was never ever on her mind. So Alison now stops in this parking bay that's kind of down the street. She's leaning over to get the stuff that she just got, the food and her laundry. And then she feels something cold against her neck. And someone says to her, move over or I will kill you. Alison then moves over to the passenger seat and this guy then gets into the driver's seat of her car. Alison said that the guy who got into her car kept saying he doesn't want to hurt her. He just wants to use her car for around an hour or so. The man then looks over at Alison. He kind of like smirks at her. And he says that his name is Clinton. And Clinton starts being even more creepier than just jumping into someone's front seat. But he starts asking, oh, do you have a boyfriend? What are you doing here? Even though he's in her car. Clinton then keeps driving and then he pulls over the car and he picks up one of his friends. And Alison said that she kind of felt okay in the sense that this guy was in her front seat. Maybe she believed that he generally didn't want to hurt her. But she said that as soon as Clinton picked up this other guy, she said that every inkling of safety that she felt was now gone. She said that the guy that they picked up in the back seat was just cold-faced, cold-hearted, and just incredibly frightening. Clinton and his friend now continue to drive out of the city, and they drive 30 kilometers out where there's just no lights at all. It's just the middle of nowhere. Clinton then stops the car. He turns to Allison and he says to her, are you going to fight? And I assume that you think that you know what's going to happen next. And yes, you may be right. But the incidents that occur after this, I just didn't expect. And now I'm just going to give you another warning about some graphic details that are coming up. Remember, Clinton's in the front driver's seat and Allison's in the passenger seat with creepy in the back. Clinton then turns to Allison and he starts touching her leg. And he keeps asking her if she has a boyfriend. And then Clinton proceeds to 
touch her inappropriately and while he's touching her he asks oh does your boyfriend do it like this i'm obviously better just weird and creepy things like that clinton then proceeds to have his way with her in the car and while clinton and allison are in the car creepy got out of the car and once clinton was done creepy then shouts to clinton and instead of creepy calling this guy clinton creepy calls him france so allison now looks up and she clicks okay this guy's name isn't clinton this guy must be called France. So France is now done with Alison. He leans out the car window and he then shouts to the creepy guy and he calls him Tinnis. France then offers up Alison to Tinnis. And what happens next, we're not exactly entirely sure about because Alison said that once Tinnis got into the car, she only remembers his hand going around her throat and then she doesn't remember much after that. And we assume that whatever happened to Alison happened kind of while she was unconscious. So like I said, a bit of warning for the next bit that I'm going to tell. So we get the picture that Alison is now out cold, but she kind of starts coming to a bit. And she's going in and out of consciousness the whole time. But when she did wake up, she would notice that France and Tennis were busy stabbing her. And the police report said that Alison was stabbed around 30 times in the abdominal area, a few times in the pubic area. And horrifically, these men tried to cut her throat 17 times. There were 17 different cut marks on her throat. And Alison described this as kind of like an outer body experience. She said that she was unconscious. She could feel that she wasn't there, but she could kind of get up above her body and see her body down below. But this outer body experience and this calmness that Alison felt all came crashing to an end when she kind of could hear now her staggered breathing. And she said that, it wasn't breathing like you would normally hear, like quiet in a sense. She said that it was so gurgled and so loud. And now she knew that these men had badly injured her because of the sound of her breathing. Alison then said that she came out of consciousness again back in her body. And she came out of consciousness and she kind of saw the men kind of walking away. They then got into the car and they drove off. Alison is now lying in the dirt. And even though she knows that she's very badly injured, she thought to herself that she did not want these men to get away. So she remembered the names of these two men and she started writing France and Tinnis in the sand that was next to her. And she also wrote, I love you, mom, in the sand. But even though Alison kept passing out, she did not want to die in the sand and she kept fighting. So Alison then became conscious again and she started feeling around and she said that she felt a very wet and cold patch between her legs. And she now realized that it was actually some of her organs that were now touching her leg. She then felt around again and she found a shirt so she picked up a shirt and she now tried to wrap the shirt around her stomach to try and keep them in. Now the next part makes me incredibly uncomfortable to describe and also to hear her describe it as well. But she describes that obviously now has a shirt around her body and she's trying to get up. But obviously she's in a lot of pain. She's very badly injured and she tried to get to her feet with immense difficulty. So she tries to crawl first but it's not working, she's too slow. She has to hold the shirt too tightly and she can't crawling and holding her body at the same time. So she tries to stand up and she eventually does. But as she stands up, she says that she just sees nothing. And she then kind of feels at her neck. And she said that her hand went kind of straight through one section of her neck. And she realized that these men had actually cut straight through and her head had flopped back. Addison then described kind of picking up the back of her hair and pulling it back up so that she could actually see. And I mean, how horror movie like, how terrifying is that that you realize that these men have taken out or basically cut through your neck. But Alison eventually made it to a road. And when she got to the road, she just collapsed and she kind of figured someone will either hit me or they will find me. Alison is lying in the middle of the road and eventually a car did stop. And luckily for her, the car was filled with guys who were all studying veterinary science. One of the guys got out of the car and he ran to her immediately. He then sees that she's bleeding everywhere. He takes off his shirt and he tries to kind of stop the bleeding as best that he could. The guys then call an ambulance and funny enough, where they were, Allison was only around 15 minutes from the hospital. So they didn't travel too far out of town, but the guys called the ambulance and they're waiting. 15 minutes go by, 30 minutes go by, 45 minutes go by. After an hour of Alison lying on this floor, an ambulance eventually arrives. The ambulance then takes Alison to a hospital and she's then obviously taken into emergency surgery. But the guy who saved her, one of the veterinary students, he said that he felt that the ambulance was driving so slowly 
and that they kind of thought that Alison was done for already and they didn't really feel the need to rush. It made him feel incredibly heart sore and he just wanted them to try at least. And he said that after that day, after seeing Alison like that, he said that he no longer wanted to be a vet anymore and he was going to study to become a doctor. The surgeons who worked on Alison said that they have never seen anything like this before. I mean, surgeons in South Africa see some pretty violent crimes and pretty violent cases, stabbings, gunshots, but this kind of brutality they've never seen. Doctors see a lot of things, um, blood, injuries, but somehow that injury made a striking impression of severe cruelty, which one doesn't see very often. You know, having an injury from a motor vehicle accident uh, or a fight in a pub or a club, you name it, doesn't look as severe as what we saw that morning. And I will show you a short video of her injuries now. I'm going to start with her neck. Of particular importance are the blood vessels, which supply blood to the head and brain. And with those vessels severed, Alison would have hemorrhaged and she would have died within three or four minutes. There are also some very important nerves that come down from the neck to supply some of the important organs. None of those were damaged. And the esophagus was undamaged. But of course, the trachea was severed. And this miracle is that it has healed so perfectly. You can see the multiple stab wounds in her chest miracle is that none of these penetrated to the lung or the heart. Then I'll go to the abdomen. This is the major incision when she was symboled. There are multiple stab wounds all around her abdomen, none of which penetrated through to damage the internal organs. So the next day after Alison had been in surgery all night, police officers came and they kind of thought that it was just a kind of domestic dispute, a very violent domestic dispute, and they weren't really prepared for what they were going to see. So police then walked into Alison's room and they were horrified with what they saw. And the doctor then pulled the police officers aside and they then described the injuries and what had actually happened to her. They obviously said that these men had their way with her. Obviously, they tried to kill her. They stabbed her in the stomach, they stabbed her in the pubic area, they tried to decapitate her. And the police obviously now were shocked and horrified, but they tried to move all those injuries aside and they tried to start kind of from the bottom. So they thought, okay, the men had their way with her, let me try and bring a book of known offenders in the area or just in the province. And maybe Alison can kind of pick one of these guys and see if any of these guys match who happened that night. So the police come back and they bring a big file of all the known perpetrators or offenders in the area. And they then show this book to Alison. Alison's kind of lying down and they're leaning over with this big massive file of photos. And they're kind of peeling over the photos. And Alison then stops and she writes down the name of one of the guys. And she writes down France as one of the men. The police are like, okay, cool. And they keep kind of paging over and they eventually get to another guy and Alison's like stop well she can't speak but she kind of moves to them to stop and she writes down Tinnis his name and the police are like okay cool so they then leave and they are kind of happy with what they have but the police then return the next day and they kind of say you know it's great that you pointed out the guys you wrote down their names we kind of feel that this case would be stronger if you could speak their names now, I'm no doctor, I can't even sew clothes together, so I can't imagine what these doctors had to do and the intricate surgery around their neck. The surgeon is still standing in the room and he's listening to what these police officers are asking. And then the surgeon who performed the surgery says to the police officers that this is going to be an incredibly painful thing for Alison to endure, like to take out this breathing pipe that she has to help her. And Alison's listening and the surgeon then describes to her what he has to do in order for her to be able to speak again. And Alison then writes down on the pad that she has and she's like, take it out. So the surgeon did, he took out the uh, breathing pipe that was helping Alison to breathe. And Alison then says, Franz and Tennis's name. And the police are like, cool, thanks, and they leave. But then Alison was moved to another ward where she could recover kind of privately and just away from everybody else. And Alison was eventually released from the ICU and from the hospital. But Alison said that she was never rid of this hospital for months. She either had to go back every day for wound cleaning, for wound checks, or for something else. And once certain wounds eventually started to heal, 
she would then have to go back into hospital to get plastic surgery on these wounds. So she noticed that the doctors were trying to help, but she said that every day was constant pain. There was nothing that was happening where she wasn't in pain. So back to tennis in France, these two men were constantly in and out of jail, and sadly, Alison was not the first lady that they had their way with. Unfortunately, two women prior to Alison had been attacked by tennis in France, and they said to these women that they attacked previously that, don't you ever go to the police. If you do, we will kill you. And they never listened. They did report tennis in France to the police, and they somehow got out of jail every time. And France and tennis then said and vowed to each other that the next lady that they find they will have to kill because they can't keep going to jail because of their crimes. And sadly, Alison was in the wrong place at the wrong time on that day. So France and Tennis were brought into custody and they were told that they were being charged with attempted murder. And France kind of looks over at the policeman and he's like, what do you mean attempted murder? And the policeman's like, actually, Alison is alive. And France and Tennis both went absolutely spook white. If you could blow them over with a feather, that's how in shock they were and they just couldn't say anything. And France then looks at the policeman and he's like, okay, well, since we're kind of guilty, basically, here's Alison's ring. And he hands over a ring that Alison had on her finger that day, which is still covered in blood. And I mean, Alison had been in hospital now for a couple of days and this guy hadn't even bothered to wash anything. So remember, Alison firstly pointed out the pictures of tennis and France while she was in bed recovering. But once she had recovered and the court case was kind of going, Alison was asked to now point them out in a lineup. And Alison said that she was absolutely terrified about this because she had to now relive it again in her mind and see these guys and be in the same room. And she was shaking and trying to do her best, but she said she just wanted to get it over and done with. So Adrian Franz Dutoy and Tienis Kruger were taken to court. And their defense for the entire act of what they did to Alison was that demons had possessed them and they were just acting on the word of Satan. And Franz actually asked for a priest to come into his cell and kind of do a whole exorcism on him, and he did have a priest come, but it clearly didn't help. The judge was not buying any of this, and he said that Tennis and France were absolutely horrible people, and that he hoped that they'd never be released from prison ever. Adrian France de Toy was sentenced to three life sentences, and Tennis Kruger was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. But even though Tennis and France had been put away in jail, Alison still had to heal, and even though her scars were healing, she suffered a lot of depression, and Alison said that she would be okay one minute and then suddenly she would get flashbacks with certain things. And she said that this was incredibly damaging to her health and her mental health, but she said that she needed to push through and she really did try to kind of uplift her spirits. Alison then eventually pushed through. She then said that she needed something to keep herself active and just busy. And someone actually asked her to publicly speak at an event and she said that she was nervous obviously to do this. But once she had spoken, she said she absolutely loved it. And Alison said once she spoke publicly at this event, she said that she felt like she now had a purpose and she loved it. And she continues to publicly speak now and she's written books and she's become very self-successful in that way in terms of being able to put a purpose to her life now afterwards. And she did eventually get married and they lived quite happily together for a couple of years. Sadly, it was not meant to last and they did end up separating but even though doctors said that she was mostly unlikely to have children, Alison did end up having two very healthy boys. And what I thought was kind of a lovely end, I guess, to this case was, remember that vet who helped save her life in the beginning? He vowed that he was going to become a doctor. Well, what was lovely, I thought, was that he actually helped to give birth to Alison's two children at the end. So he did keep his promise and become a doctor, which I thought was quite nice. And that is the case of Alison Boerta. And thank you very much for the suggestion, guys. I really appreciate it. What an horrific case. I can't, like, we've done some really violent cases. And this sits up there with Anine Boyson, Hannah Cornelius. And it's just terrible that these kind of cases happen to our women. But I'm happy that Alison is okay now. And I am glad that she survived. But let me know your thoughts down below. I hope you have a great day further, stay away from strangers, and I'll see you again next week. Bye!